there was quite a bit of uh, similarity between me and the, the Cheyenne character. Number one, I'd, I'd been carrying a gun and a badge for about four years before I did Cheyenne, so when I had to, to wear a gun and a badge, I felt right at home with it. It uh, seemed pretty natural. I had a lot of different jobs because I hadn't really found what I wanted to do, and uh, most of the jobs that I took, you know, was to pay the rent and, and uh, put food on the table and take care of the family. During the Second World War, it was either go in the Army or join the Merchant Marine, and I'd already worked on the river boats during the summer somewhat as a deckhand. So I went on and worked uh, uh, on the Great Lakes, on the ore ships, and I, I got uh, my saltwater papers, and uh, we were taking uh, loads of grain to uh, North Africa and uh, going up to the Aleutian Islands, taking stuff up there. And uh, I spent a while in Texas with a buddy of mine that I was in the Merchant Marine with in Brownwood, Texas. By then I was married. I had a daughter, Valerie. And then I uh, decided to go to California, drove out there and got a job working as a carpenter, didn't like it too well. And I went from that to uh, uh, into security work, uh, watching the longshoremen uh, and merchandise and all that uh, for eight hours, come home, clean up, and then I'd go work as a bouncer in the nightclubs for six hours. Didn't leave a whole lot of time for anything else. And uh, then I finally heard that it paid a lot better in uh, Las Vegas, and I, I drove up there I went to see the sheriff and he said, well, I hate to tell you, he said, you got to live here for six months before you can, you can get a job as a deputy. And he said, uh, Mr. Francis is uh, going to be head of uh, the security at the new Sands Hotel. They got a mo about a month before they open and he'd like to hire you. He said, can you go to work t tomorrow morning? So that's what I did. Later in the year, maybe seven, eight months later, uh, Van Johnson was there, and he said, uh, look, I don't know if you're interested or not, but there's one of Hollywood's biggest agents here, and he'd like to talk to you. Would you be interested? And we talked, and I guess I didn't seem too excited about it. He gave me his card, said, you'd have to come to Hollywood, of course. He said, if you decide to do that, look me up. Can't promise you anything. We'll see what we can do. <laughs> The thought occurred to me, you know, uh, I'm, I'm not going to get that far carrying a gun and a badge. It doesn't pay all that well. If you make movies, you can make some pretty good money. Plus, the bullets aren't real, and uh, if I got to play the hero, I get to win all the time. So anyhow, I went down and tried my luck. It took a year and a half to get a break, and oddly enough, it didn't really come through the agent. I happened to meet an old-timer on the street. And he told me, he said, you know, the Ten Commandments are looking for big guys like you. If you want to give me your, your phone number, I'll see if I can set up a, uh, an interview. And I didn't really think that he could, but I didn't want to hurt his feelings. So I gave him my phone number and forgot about it. About two weeks later, I get a call. And he had set up an interview with uh, Henry Wilcoxon, who he set up an appointment for me to meet DeMille. And the day I was supposed to be, uh, meet DeMille, I was coming in from North Hollywood uh, and got on the freeway, and I noticed an elderly lady trying to change a tire on her car, and I could tell it that uh, she was having a tough time doing it. So I stopped, and I changed the tire for her, and, and she said, what, what do I owe you? And I said, you don't owe me anything, man. And she said, well, I hope I haven't made you late for anything. I said, well, I have an appointment uh, at Paramount Studios, but I'm sure it'll be all right. And I got there and I was a little late. And when I came in to meet DeMille, I'll never forget. He said, you're late, young man. And I thought, uh-oh, my career has ended before it begins. And I said, I'm sorry, sir. I stopped to help somebody on the freeway. He said, yes, I know all about that. It just so happens that was my secretary. So I got a reprieve there. But uh, he did give me the part of the uh, captain of the Sardinian Guard because I'm blue-eyed, and the Sardinian Guard uh, evidently did have blue eyes. 
was an excellent opportunity for me to watch the real pros, uh, the big timers. It was very exciting for me. I was very much in, in awe of those people, and yet I, I learned they do make mistakes, so I thought maybe there's hope for me. From that, uh, Henry Wilcoxon had arranged for me to take a couple of screen tests. Then uh, Hal Wallace saw the screen test, put me under contract for six months. I didn't do anything for him. Uh, a month and a half later, uh, Warners had saw the screen test and bought, bought the contract from Hal Wallace. So I wind up over at Warners, and uh, then they were in uh, preparation to make uh, Cheyenne uh, the first uh, uh, venture into TV. I had to audition two separate days for Cheyenne with all the other leading men there in Hollywood. And the first one, uh, I thought, you know, I don't stand a chance in the world. These guys, you know, they have experience, blah, blah, blah. And uh, so the second day, I just had fun with it. I figured, yeah, I'm not going to get it anyway. So I just had fun with it, and that's the secret, is to have fun with it and be, your, be yourself and relax. And uh, Jack Warner decided that I would do Cheyenne. And uh, from there, we started doing them. This here is Cheyenne. So you're Cheyenne Bodie. One of the first Cheyennes I did, uh, we did in a place called Vasquez Rocks, uh, north of the valley there. And uh, there was a, a very narrow uh, little canyon we had to go through, things only about four feet wide, something like that. It's big enough for a horse and a man to ride through, but the uh, the horse that I was riding at the time, uh, the guys told me, said, hey, watch the little horse. When you go through that narrow defile there, raise both legs up along his withers, because he's got a nasty habit of wanting to bang you up against the rock there, and he could hurt your leg. So I did what they told me, and sure enough, he banged up against the rock and smashed the, the canteen flat. In fact, when we started the uh, series, I told him, I said, well, I haven't, I haven't ridden horse that much. And they laughed, and they said, well, you'll, uh, you're going to get plenty of experience now. I said, you'll either become a good rider or maybe a dead one, and they laughed. And a couple of times I wondered about that. And uh, they gave me a horse called Brandy. And I'll tell you what a wonderful, wonderful horse that was. He was 16 hands. And uh, what a great horse. He never, ever let me down in any way, shape, or form. But uh, and I'm, I was always thinking, boy, I hope he doesn't run into a prayer dog hole or something because he'll break his leg and, uh, and I'm going to take a real flyer there. But. He never, ever went down. And uh, he was just, uh, I think when I stopped riding Brandy, he was 26 years old, but you'd never know it. <laughs> I'll never forget, I think it was about